Orlando by Virginia Woolf. Dramatized for radio by Peter Buckman. Orlando was terribly late. That is what comes of trying to write poetry, despairing, and dashing out of the house to fling yourself at the foot of a tall oak tree. For he, and there could be no doubt of his sex, needed something to attach his floating heart to, and to the oak tree he tied it. But then the old Queen Elizabeth arrived to do honour to Orlando's father in his vast house with its uncountable chimneys, and Orlando should have been there to greet her. way to the great hall, in the back quarters where the servants lived, Orlando stopped. The housekeeper's door stood open. Sitting at a table, with a tankard beside him and paper in front, was a rather fat, rather shabby man with a pen in his hands. But he was not writing. He seemed to be rolling some thought up and down, to and fro in his mind. He did not see Orlando. Is this man a poet? Is it poetry he's writing? I wonder if he would tell me. Orlando wanted the poet to tell him everything in the world, for he had the wildest, most extravagant ideas about poets and poetry. But how do you speak to a man who does not see you, who sees ogres and satyrs and the depths of the sea instead? Orlando was overcome with shyness and darted off. Arriving at last at the great hall, Orlando was just in time to sink to his knees and hanging his head in confusion to offer a bowl of rose water to the great queen herself. So, this is the young Lord Orlando. Let me look at you. Such eyes. It is my duty as Orlando's biographer to admit that he had eyes like drenched violets. Such legs. And the finest legs that a young nobleman has ever stood upright on. I am your majesty's most humble and devoted servant. So it was that within two years, during which period Orlando had written no more than a score of tragedies, a dozen histories, and a sheaf of sonnets, he was summoned to the queen's side to become her favourite attendant. We are allowed, as his biographer, to mention that Orlando had, at this season of his life, a certain liking for low company. The age was the Elizabethan, and their morals were not ours. There was also the fact that one of his grandmothers had worn a smock and carried milk pails. But Orlando always held that the mixture of blue blood and brown earth was a good one. At the court of King James... The names of at least three ladies were freely coupled with his in marriage. Indeed, he was engaged to wed the Lady Margaret Tierconnell, one of the Irish Desmonds. But as the lawyers were in the midst of all the business that is necessary before one great fortune can mate with another, there came, with the suddenness and severity that then marked the English climate, the Great Frost. Birds froze in mid-air and fell like stones to the ground. At Norwich, a young woman started to cross the road in her usual robust health when the icy blast struck at the corner. Ah! Onlookers saw her turn visibly to powder oh! and be blown away in a puff of dust over the roofs. But while country people suffered and trade was at a standstill, the king ordered that the River Thames, which was frozen to a depth of more than 20 feet for six or seven miles, should be made into a pleasure ground at royal expense. And he railed off a space opposite the palace at Greenwich, which at once became the centre of the most brilliant society in England. Me a coranto, my lord Orlando. 
Margaret, my beloved, for you I would even essay the Lavolta. But you know what a clumsy fool I am at these foreign dances. Your legs are the admiration of the entire court, dearest. The king himself has said. Never mind what King Jamie says. He slobbers so much you can hardly understand what he's talking about. And if I have to go once more with him to see that old bumboat woman frozen at 20 fathoms with her apples in her lap... Well, shall we dance? There. Is that a man or a woman? What man could be so seductive? And yet what woman could skate so fast? She or he, I can't tell in that Russian tunic. Who would have thought the Muscovites could produce such people? As glowing as a melon, as miraculous as a pineapple, as lustrous as an emerald, as sleek as a fox in the snow. Though we must not pause a moment in this narrative, we may hastily note that all these images were taken from things Orlando had liked as a boy. An emerald, an olive tree, the legs and hands and bearing of a boy. <gasps> oh, don't let it be a boy. I cannot fall in love with a... Orlando! Orlando! No boy could have a mouth like that. No boy could have breasts like that, the heavens be praised. No boy could have eyes which look, which look as if they've been fished from the very bottom of the sea. She is a woman. A woman. He trembled and turned hot. A woman. I must know her name. He turned cold and longed to hurl himself through the air. Her name! It was the Princess Marusha Stanilovska Dagmar Natasha Ilyana Romanovich. Later, though we should not anticipate, Orlando called her Sasha, after a white Russian fox with teeth like steel he had had as a boy. But now... Orlando! Will you help me up? Orlando! What have I loved till now? A nun? A hard-mouthed adventuress, a nodding mass of lace and ceremony. But now, but now. Oh, oh my dearest. Darling, Sasha. Yes, my Orlando. I have never loved till now. Mm. Do you know that? I thought I was in love. But they were like... like wood compared with you. Like sackcloth. Like cinders. Mm. Oh, why doesn't the ice melt with our passion? Oh, that poor old woman we passed. Hacking at the ice for water. Mm. Had she our love, she need but touch it with her finger, so. <laughs> oh, you English do not know how to deal with the ice and the snow. Sometimes I detest you. Not all of us, I trust. In Russia, we have space. Not like being in a cage, like here. But we are alone, my little fox, my olive tree. There is no one to disturb us. Alone. In my country, the rivers are ten miles wide. And you can gallop six horses abreast all day long and not meet anybody. My family is the great emptiness. The silent snow, the cracking pine trees, the wild horses, and the wild men, too. Now come. Come, Orlando. The ice gets cold. Come, let us skate some more. You will not catch me. Come. Sasha! Look, my Orlando, the sheep of my country. See how pretty is the flag with the black eagle and the icicles of many colors. Shall we go aboard? My little fox, we shall run away together. Did we not agree? On the first dark night. And what is our password? Jour de ma vie. And, for running away, I must have some fresh clothes. You will wait for me here. I will go and look. Oh. Oh. What is it, my princess? 
it is nothing. Uh, there is here a, a member of the crew who startled me. Do not worry. He has a candle and he will help me find my things. Time went by and Orlando, wrapped in his own dreams, thought only of the pleasures of life. My friends will say it's madness to ruin a career for a Cossack and a waste of snow. But what do they understand of love? And Margaret. Mm, Margaret. Her family will rightly abuse me for deserting her. But life with her, when I can have a life with my fox, my emerald, my Sasha. <laughs> Suddenly seized with those dark forebodings which shadowed even his most confident thoughts, Orlando plunged down to the hold of the ship. Sasha! My Sasha! Where are you, little fox? Little... Oh! For one second, Orlando had a vision of Sasha and the sailor, of her seated on his knee, of her bending towards him, of their embracing... And then the light was blotted out in a red cloud by his rage, and he blazed into such a howl of anguish that the whole ship echoed. Oh! Oh. Oh. There, my Orlando, there. Is that better? Hmm? Here, drink, rest, recover yourself. But I saw, I saw. What did you see? A candle blowing in the wind, a shadow. What is there inside your head that makes your eyes play such tricks? You and that sailor. You think that I, a Romanovich, would allow myself to be touched by a common seaman? May God destroy me if it were so. Aziz, your English manners that you insult me so. I shall leave your country this night. But I thought... Forgive me. You thought... Your head is so full of nonsense that you see things that never happened. I wanted my clothes. The box was heavy. He helped me move it. <laughs> Look at him, the great, dull giant. Would your Sasha allow herself to be crushed by a bear like that? How I would like to believe you and... You yeah. don't believe me? Then farewell. Sasha, I saw you. Perdition take it, I saw you. Oh, you will beg my pardon. Oh, that is the end. Yes, yes, I do beg your pardon. I must have been mistaken. My brain. Oh, it is the maddest brain in England. Oh, but it lives with the bluest eyes and the finest legs. Can you walk now? Yes, I can walk. Oh, we will go. Oh, Vidimsa. Prashchai. What are you saying? I am saying to him to, to get my clothes to the city. Come, we will climb down onto the ice. Little fox. My Christmas tree, come. Do svidania, Milochka. And what did that mean? Oh, goodbye. That is all. You must teach me how to say that. It sounds so loving and so tender. Come, let me help you oh. down. <coughs> Is there? Could there be something about her? Something coarse? That peasant. And yet, I saw her once gnawing in secret at a candle end. What if she herself is of peasant stock? No, it's not possible. It's not possible. Never, never, never! See how dark it is when the fireworks have faded. What a star to be seen. But you have your own lights, my Orlando, that burn like a lamp lit within. And you are like the stream when the snow is melted, like the new green that unfurls on the sturdy beech tree. And you are like a million candled Christmas tree, such as we have in Russia. Enough to light a whole street by. Your cheeks that glow like flame. Your hair like coals on top of them. My princess, it is pitch black. 
It is the night we have been waiting for. <gasps> Jour de ma vie. Jour de ma vie. You know what to do. I meet you at midnight at Blackfriars. I shall have horses waiting. In von Arsen. <gasps> Jour de ma vie. Jour de ma vie. It will be an eternity. Jour de ma vie. Do you uh, need the company of a lady, sir? Uh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. I mistook you for someone else. Yeah. What the? The great frost had lasted so long that it took Orlando a minute to realize that what had struck him on the cheek was a rainbow. Within five minutes, he was soaked to the skin. The air was thicker now than ever. The roads, pitted with great holes, were underwater and perhaps impassable. Yet he could not believe this would affect their escape. All his senses were bent upon gazing along the cobbles for Sasha's coming. But then... The voice of St. Paul's raised every hair of anguish in Orlando's soul. With the superstition of a lover, he had made out that it was on the sixth stroke that she would come. But the strokes went on and on, first heralding and then proclaiming death and disaster. At last, he knew his doom was sealed. Jour de ma vie. This biographer is now faced with a difficulty which it is better to confess than to gloss over. We have come to something dark, mysterious and unexplained. Let us state the facts and leave the listeners to make what they may of them. In the summer that saw the downfall of all Orlando's hopes, he retired to his great house and lived in complete solitude. One June morning, it was Saturday the 18th. Uh, my lord, uh, my lord, your breakfast is on the table. Forgive me, my lord, but it is long past your usual hour for getting up. Is your lordship not feeling well? Uh, my lord. I did venture to shake him, Mrs. Grimsditch, but he still won't move. Is he breathing? He don't appear to be. I can't hear anything. Yet he looks well enough. Fetch the chaplain, Stubbs. He's an expert on living and dying, isn't he? Well, Mr. Dupper, here's the thing. His lordship not breathing, not waking, and not dead, if I may be judged. Uh, indeed, Mrs. Grimsditch, his lordship looks the very picture of health. Right. Uh, maybe one of them Irish lords has put a curse on him, Mr. Dupper, for what he did to the Lady Margaret. I should thank the Lord that we don't have her here as our mistress. Oh, my lord. Oh, do you hear us, my lord? His lordship is no believer in idle superstition. Not like King Jamie and his witches. I'm inclined to think he is sleeping for a reason. Perhaps his conscience is troubling him. Pish, Mr. Dupper. Hmm? All of us have something on our conscience, I dare say, but that doesn't mean we sleep our lives the way on account of it. Still he doesn't stir. I shall say a prayer. Oh, Lord and God, I shall be the God. Brought... <laughs> Nothing. Mustard plaster, my mother used to say, applied to the feet. Still nothing. Oh, a gorse bush under his pillow. Still nothing. Alas, our master will not come back to us. <laughs> oh. But on the seventh day, Orlando woke at his usual time. What is all this noise? Stop it at once. Hello, Art. Heaven be praised. What is the matter with you all? You have been asleep this last seven days, your lordship. We had almost given you up for dead. I feel perfectly all right. It could have been the trout cook served you for dinner. I thought at the time that she put too much pepper on it. Perhaps that is what caused you not I don't remember to... having trout. Uh, it was them Irish. Irish, Stubbs? What are you talking about? Uh, Stubbs has some foolish notion, my lord, that the family of your former betrothed, feeling themselves slighted... Was I betrothed? Your lordship has no memory of the Lady Margaret. The name does have a thing. Uh, does your lordship remember the Great Frost? 
Frost. And the Russian princess that we heard your lordship. Saddle my horse, Stubbs. I need to take a long, hard ride to clear my head of all the mist that surround it. A Frost and a Russian princess. I know not what I know. When the events of the past six months were discussed in his presence, Orlando seemed not so much distressed as puzzled. It was observed that if Russia was mentioned, or princesses, or ships, he would fall into a gloom of an uneasy kind. But the doctors were hardly wiser then than they are now. And after some prescribed rest and some exercise, some that he should starve and others that he should feed himself up, some that he should take newt slobber on rising, others that he should drink peacock's gall on going to bed, they left him to himself and gave it as their opinion that he had been asleep for a week. But if sleep it was, of what nature was it? Having waited in vain for an answer, let us get on with our story. The death of Ajax. No. The birth of Pyramus. No. The oak tree. Aha. Why did he pause? Well, for some such reason as this. Nature who has played so many queer tricks on us, making us so unequally of clay and diamonds, of rainbow and granite. Nature, who delights in muddle and mystery, so that even today we do not know why we go upstairs or why we come down again. Nature, who has so much to answer for besides the unwieldy length of this sentence, has added to our confusion by providing that the rag bag of odds and ends within us is lightly stitched together by a single thread, that of memory. Why did she leave me? Was she forced to? What if it was all a plot? Where is she now, I wonder? Is she married? What if she's dead? Oh! The blot thus made on his parchment, explain it how one may, and perhaps no explanation is possible, memory is inexplicable, at once substituted for the face of the Russian princess a face of a very different sort. That fat, shabby man I came across sitting and staring when the old queen came so many years ago. He had the most amazing eyes. But who the devil was he? Not a nobleman, not one of us. Orlando would not have said such a thing aloud in company, for he was the most courteous of gentlemen. But it shows what an effect noble birth has on the mind, and, incidentally, how difficult it is for a nobleman to be a writer. A poet, I dare say. Again, Orlando paused. And into the breach thus made leapt ambition, the harridan, and poetry, the witch, and desire of fame, the strumpet, all joined hands and made of his heart their dancing ground. What remains of my ancestors? Skulls in the family vault, a bony finger with a ring, whereas a man and his words, they will live forever. A man and his words... I, I shall be the finest poet in England. He resolved, after many months of such torture, to break a solitude of many years and communicate with the outside world in order to talk of literature. Mr. Nicholas Green. Mr. Nicholas Green. Mr. Nicholas Green.
My dear Mr. Green, you do great honour to my house. <coughs> Ow! This blasted cur has just bitten me. If the truth be told, Orlando was a little disappointed at the sight of Mr. Green. For all his knowledge of mankind, Orlando was puzzled where to place him. The poet's face had none of that stately composure which makes the nobility so pleasing to look at, nor had it anything of the dignified civility of the well-trained domestic. It was a face seamed, puckered, drawn together, and there was something fiery and suspicious in its glance. It was not the face of the angel Orlando had imagined. Nevertheless, they went into dinner. Orlando was, for the first time, unaccountably ashamed of the number of his servants and the splendor of his table. Stranger still, he was suddenly proud of his great-grandmother, Moll, who milked cows. One of my grandmothers, you know, Mr. Green. My family, of course, came over with the conqueror. Oh, yes. Common though the name of Green has become. We used to belong to the highest, the very highest nobility in France. Strange, is it not, to think that? Oh, thank you. I, I will just take a little more of the fish. She? I mean, my great grandmother. I don't know, my lord, if you know the borough of Greenwich. I fancy I do. Named after my family, you see. Green. Greenwich. <laughs> oh, yes, we once had castles like this one, I dare say. But those have been lost like the E at the end of our name, which certain members of the family decided unforgivably to drop. Ah, venison. How excellent. My great-grandmother was a milkmaid. Indeed. Where did you get your wine? I was wondering what you thought, Mr. Green, of the poetry Poetry? Of... Oh, don't talk to me about poetry. Certain poets are the most scurrilous people on earth, after publishers and critics. Certain poets will pinch your ideas and gloss them over with inferior verses, and publishers are so ignorant and so greedy that they will rush into print with a work that has manifestly been stolen from another superior hand. Oh, yes, it's happened to me, I can tell you. But, but what will you say of the critics? <sighs> Surely they notice the difference between the original and the imitation? Not a bit of it, my dear lord. Critics! are as ignorant as publishers. Indeed, more so. I was going to seek your opinion on, on a small thing I've written myself. Oh! Was that a mouse? I don't think so. I'm sure I heard a mouse. Positively. Oh, oh you don't understand me, dear Lord, what an appalling state my nerves are in. A mouse could upset them for a fortnight. That was one reason why I was glad to accept your invitation. The peace, as I thought... Of the countryside. You could not have a more peaceful or a more healthful place than this, Mr. Green. I am, my dear Lord, altogether so finely made and so curiously put together that it amazes me to think that I've only sold 500 copies of my last poem. But, of course, that is entirely due to the conspiracy against me. Say what you like, my dear Lord, but the art of poetry is dead in England. What? With Shakespeare... Could that have been the fat and shabby man with the amazing eyes? Shakespeare in this house? No, impossible. I I'm so sorry. Mm. You were saying poetry is dead. Yeah. But with Shakespeare still writing, and Marlowe not long dead, and Thomas Brown, and John Donne, and Ben Jonathan. <laughs> Shakespeare has dashed off a few good scenes, but he pinched them from Marlowe. Marlowe was all right, but what can you say of someone who was dead before reaching 30? Donne... He just disguises his utter lack of meaning by using hard words. Some fools are taken in, but that style will be out of fashion in a twelve months. As for Ben Johnson, well, Ben is a friend of mine, and I never speak ill of my friends. But isn't this... Surely this is the greatest age of literature this country's ever known. The great age of literature, my dear Lord, is long past. Our own age is, in every respect, inferior to that of the Greeks. The ancients had a divine ambition, my dear Lord, an ambition for what I might call la glore. I beg your pardon? La glore. Don't you speak French, my Lord? Glory. 
<laughs> Young writers today don't know the meaning of the word. They're all in the pay of booksellers and pour out any trash that will sell. Look at Shakespeare. He's the worst offender. And he's already paying the penalty. Ah, there's no good in the present, my dear lord, and no hope for the future. Oh, ah, kind of you, yeah. I will just help myself to a, a little more. So, a person who wants to be a poet, what must he do then? Cherish the past, my dear lord. Honour those writers who take antiquity for their model and write not for pay, but for glory. Yes, to glory. La gloire. <laughs> Had I but a pension of um, three hundred pound per annum, paid quarterly, I would live for glory alone. <laughs> I would lie in bed every morning reading Cicero. I would imitate his style so carefully you couldn't tell the difference between us. That's what I call fine writing. That's what I call glory. But uh, it would need a pension to do it. One that was paid quarterly. Time passed. Orlando had never met anyone like this poet before. He was witty, he was irreverent, he was a brilliant storyteller, and the first person, and perhaps the last, to toast cheese in the great marble fireplace. That he did not know a mastiff from a greyhound or wheat from barley, that he thought oranges grew underground and turnips on trees, all this amazed Orlando and gave him much to think about. As for Nick Green, he came to the conclusion he was being smothered alive. My dear Lord, my dear Lord, I have not been able to sleep a wink all night because of the silence. The silence, my Lord, is of all things most oppressive to me nerves. Unless I end my visit this very day, I shall fall asleep. Oh, and sleeping, die. My dear Mr. Green, you will be much missed, especially by the maids. <laughs> but not by that cur of yours. My mastiff? Call him what you like. He bit me every time he saw the opportunity. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. I dare say he'll be glad to have his liberty restored. Mr. Green, there is a small favour I hesitate to ask of you. Ask, my dear lord. Your hospitality has been most generous. I wondered if I might solicit your opinion on a play of my own. The Death of Hercules... I know it's a mighty thing to ask of so great a poet as yourself. My dear lord, to write for la gloire, in the manner of Cicero. I shall make arrangements to have a pension paid to you. <gasps> Quarterly. My dear lord. The least I can do, for la gloire. For la gloire. Oh, my dear lord, I embrace you. <laughs> and now, farewell. Time passed, a description of which I could give you by reference to trees greening and browning, moon sickle and circular, night succeeding day and so forth, but it is simpler to say time passed and nothing whatever happened. And though I might reflect on the nature of time and its effect on the human spirit, I have my duty to perform as a biographer, and so I shall confine myself to saying that when a man has reached the age of thirty, as Orlando now had, time when he is thinking becomes inordinately long, and time when he is doing becomes inordinately short. The grass is green. The sky is blue. No, it isn't, damn it. It's like... The veils which a thousand Madonnas have let fall from their hair. No, it isn't. Another metaphor by Jupiter, and both descriptions are utterly false. The great age of poetry is dead, my lord. Cicero and La Gloire, my lord. La Gloire, above all. La Gloire. 
I'll be damned if I ever write another word or try to write another word to please Nick Green or the muse. Bad, good or indifferent, I'll write from this day forward to please myself. This was one of the most remarkable oaths of Orlando's lifetime. It bound him to a servitude than which none is stricter. Is there any more papers your lordship wishes to burn? No, Stubbs. We've reduced to ashes 57 of my poetical works. And, Stubbs, the world is a better place for their destruction. Having appointed himself the first writer of his age, conferring upon himself that immortality which had escaped his more martial ancestors, Orlando now decided that fame was... A braided coat which hampers the limbs. A jacket of silver which curbs the heart. A painted shield which covers a scarecrow. Uh, the pith uh, of his phrases was that while fame impedes and constricts, obscurity wraps about a man like a mist. Obscurity is dark and ample and free. It lets the mind take its way unimpeded. Here have lived for more centuries than I can count the obscure generations of my own obscure family. Unknown, they may have died, but they always left something for those who came after. And I, too, following in your hallowed footsteps. I, too... But Orlando fumbled the peroration. He would have liked to have ended with a flourish to the effect that he would follow in their footsteps and add another stone to the building. But since it already covered nine acres, to add even a single stone seemed superfluous. Could one mention, say, furniture in a peroration? Could one speak of chairs and tables and mats to lie beside people's beds? For whatever the peroration wanted, that was what the house stood in need of. Here is the king's bedroom, my lord. Uh, oh, now will you just look at the state of that towel horse? When did a king last sleep here, Mrs Grimsditch? Oh, king Jamie was the last, your lordship, and that was nearly half a century ago. Of course, King Charles, God bless his matted memory, never came while your lordship was... Uh, uh, out of society, shall we say, and, and those odious parliament people would not have had the presumption. Is it so long since we've had such company? Oh, there was Mr Green, of course, and he made such a stain on the carpet with his nasty pipe smoking that all our scrubbing has not been able to get it out. So long? I fear I've become a little hard of hearing, my lord. What was it you said? I was saying it is time we put things in order, Mrs Grimsditch. Oh. We will restore this house to all its former glory. Oh. Accordingly, Orlando began to give a series of very splendid entertainments for the nobility and gentry of the neighbourhood. The 365 bedrooms were full for a month at a time. Guests jostled one another on the 52 staircases. 300 servants bustled about the pantry. And in a very few years, Orlando had worn the nap off his new velvet and spent the half of his fortune. But he had the good opinion of his neighbours, held a score of offices, and annually had perhaps a dozen volumes of poetry dedicated to him by grateful poets. But when the feasting was at its height, Orlando would steal away to his private room and take out an old writing book stitched together with silk stolen from his mother's workbox and labelled in a round schoolboy hand, The Oak Tree. Since he scratched out as many lines as he put in, the sum at the end of the year was rather less than at the beginning, but his style had changed amazingly. It was less florid, less abundant. Perhaps his senses were a little duller, and the fact that the houses were better drained and the streets better lit must certainly have affected him. One day, as he was adding a line or two, a shadow crossed the tail of his eye. 
no shadow, but the figure of a very tall lady in riding hood and mantle crossing his private courtyard. Madam, you are in my private courtyard. May I ask what you're doing here? <laughs> I must ask your lordship to forgive me. I am the Archduchess Harriet Griselda of Finster Ahorn and Scand Op Boom. I saw your picture, and you are the very image of a sister of mine, long since dead. Can you wonder at my wanting to make your acquaintance? The visitor resembled nothing so much as a hare, a hare whose timidity is overcome by an immense and foolish audacity, a hare, moreover, over six feet high. Has this person escaped from an asylum? I am honoured, Archduchess. I was visiting the English court. Your queen is a cousin of mine. Perhaps I may offer your grace a glass of wine. Oh, thank you. Your king is a very good fellow, but he seldom goes to bed sober. As for the rest of your English nobility... I hope this is to your grace's taste. Oh, <laughs> ah, her burgundy, very fine. Is it the 61? Yes, I believe it is. May I ask if all the ladies of your country have so intimate a knowledge of wine? <laughs> and, and the suit of armour by your table, is that not by Jacobi? But I'm not sure. I, I rather think it's by Top. Oh, Jacobi, I would swear. Look at the way the tie pieces are so delicately worked. <laughs> if I if I may take the liberty of fitting this shin piece to your lordship's leg. <clears throat> that Orlando had the shapeliest legs any nobleman stood upright on has already been said. Suddenly and unaccountably, Orlando heard the beating of love's wings. The distant stir of that soft plumage roused in him a thousand memories, and he was ready to let the bird of beauty alight on his shoulder when... To his horror, the air went dark with coarse black wings. Voices croaked, and there landed on his shoulder the heaviest and foulest of birds, the vulture! Apologise to the Archduchess. Explain that I've been taken ill and see her to her carriage. Yes, my lord. Uh, if her grace wishes to return again tomorrow, what am I to say? Oh, tell her I'm ill. She's very persistent, my lord, and she's staying close by. Then, Stubbs, call my carriage and drive me to London, for I cannot stay here, Stubbs. She's made this place uninhabitable. I must leave instantly. Nell, I, I wish you would not pelt us with hazelnuts. It shows a want of respect for our crown. Oh, nonsense, Charlie. Would you rather throw me oranges at you? I protest. I... <laughs> Why, my Lord Orlando. And what brings you to our court? Oh, the finest pair of legs in England. That's what brings them. Peace, Nell. Speak, Orlando. I have a boon to ask of your majesty. Ask, and it shall be granted, assuming the cost to be little. I desire to serve your majesty in some far-off land... Would your majesty consider appointing me ambassador extraordinary to Constantinople? <laughs> and allow such a pair of legs out of the country? Don't do it, Charlie. Hold your peace, Nell. If you wish it, Orlando, the post is yours, though we should be sorry to have you so far from us. Oh, it's a crime, I say. I humbly thank your majesty, and so take my leave. Mr. Squin, farewell. Don't stay away too long, my lord, and watch what you get up to. <laughs> 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 There exist, even now, rumours and legends about Orlando's life in Constantinople, incomplete and unauthenticated though these be. He was said to pass out of the embassy gates in disguise and mingle with the crowds in the bazaars and mosques. Once shepherds bringing their goats to market reported seeing an English lord on a mountain top praying aloud to his god. This was thought to be Orlando himself. And the prayer was no doubt the poem that he always carried about with him, 
a much-scored manuscript from which, according to his servants, he chanted when he was alone. For Orlando had, in the prime of his life, the power to stir the fancy, the power that is compounded of beauty, birth, and some rarer gift, which we may call glamour, and have done with it. A million candles burn in you, Orlando. He spoke in his ordinary voice, and Echo beat a silver gong. He became the adored of many women and some men, and yet, as far as is known, he made no friends nor formed any attachments. Indeed, so assiduous was he in his duties that the king conferred upon him the honour of a dukedom. Naturally, the envious said it was due to Nell Gwynne and her memory of his legs. It was the end of Ramadan when Orlando's patent of nobility arrived, and he made this the occasion for an entertainment more splendid than any that had been known in Constantinople before or since. Either the people expected a miracle. Some say a shower of gold was prophesied to fall from the skies, which did not happen. Or this was the signal chosen for the attack to begin. Nobody seems to know. The records were burned in what followed, and we must pick our way among the bits as best we can. But as Orlando settled the coronet on his head, a great uproar arose. <laughs> Natives pressed into the crowded banqueting rooms. Women shrieked, and had it not been for the presence of a squad of British blue jackets, there is no knowing what might have happened. They quelled the disorder, and quiet, at least for the time being, fell upon the scene. So far we are on the firm, if narrow, ground of truth. But nobody has ever known what took place later that night. The ambassador was seen to go to his room, still wearing his ducal robes. Some say he locked his door, contrary to his usual custom. A washerwoman, kept awake by toothache, said she saw a man come out on the balcony and let down a rope, up which climbed a woman, much muffled but apparently of the peasant class. They embraced passionately. Next day, the Duke, as we must call him, was found in a deep sleep from which it proved impossible to wake him. The room was in great disorder, and the table was littered with papers. A doctor was summoned, who applied all the remedies which had been used on the previous occasion. But still Orlando slept. His secretaries thought it their duty to examine his papers. I'd say. What do you think this is? <laughs> it's poetry, you nincompoop. Don't be absurd. His Majesty's ambassadors don't waste their time writing poetry. It must be a code. The lines rhyme, don't they? It's about some sort of oak tree, as far as I can make out. Looks as though he's been working on it for some time by the state of it. I found something a lot more interesting. Look mm. at this. What is it? This, my dear fellow, is nothing less than a deed of marriage, properly signed, sealed and witnessed. <gasps> who are the partners? The Lord Orlando and... <whistles> well, who? Come on, who is it? Rosina Pepita, a dancer, father unknown, mother also unknown, but reputed a seller of old iron in the marketplace over against the Galata Bridge. I say, perhaps she's drugged him. Cast some sort of spell. But why would his grace, I mean, why a gypsy dancer? On the seventh day of his trance, which happened to be a Thursday, the first shot was fired in that celebrated revolt of the Turks against the Sultan. The town was set on fire, and every foreigner was either put to the sword or the bastinado. The rioters broke into Orlando's room, but stretched to all appearance dead, they left him untouched and only robbed him of his coronet and robes of the garter. 
And now we come to something so mysterious that we almost wish we could say Orlando died and was buried and thus spare the listener what is to come. But here, alas, truth, candour and honesty, the austere gods who keep watch and ward by the inkpot of the biographer, cry no. Putting their silver trumpets to their lips, they demand in one blast... Truth, 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 and nothing but the truth. Orlando awoke. He stretched himself. He rose up. He stretched himself in complete nakedness. Very well. The truth is that he was a woman. No human being since the world began has ever looked more ravishing. He had a man's strength and a woman's grace. In every other respect, he remained precisely as he had been. His face was the same. His, or rather we must now say her, memory was unimpaired, save for some slight haziness here and there. The change was accomplished so painlessly and completely, Orlando herself showed no surprise at it. Some have tried to prove that Orlando had always been a woman. Others, that she is at this moment a man. Let biologists and psychologists determine. It is enough for us to state the simple fact. Orlando was a man till the age of 30, when he became a woman and has remained so ever since. Orlando left Constantinople and passed many happy months in the mountains with gypsies. But after a while, she grew homesick and, as luck would have it, found a ship that was returning to England. To pretend to be helpless. What ecstasy. It must be remembered that Orlando was like a child with a new toy. Her notions would not commend themselves to a mature woman who has had her sex all her life. But does that mean I must respect the opinion of the other sex, however monstrous I think it? Oh! In tossing her skirt at her impatience, Orlando showed an inch or two of calf. A sailor on the top mast, who happened to look down at that moment, started so violently that he missed his footing and only saved himself by the skin of his teeth. The sight of my ankles means death to an honest fellow who no doubt has a wife and family to support, then I suppose I must, in all humanity, keep them covered. Yet her legs were, as I believe I have said, amongst her chiefest glories. <gasps> oh, a pox on them. And that is the last oath I shall ever be able to swear. Once I set foot on English soil, I shall never be able to crack a man over the head. Or tell him he lies in his teeth, or draw my sword and run him through, or sit amongst my peers wearing my coronet, or lead an army, or prance down Whitehall on a charger. All I can do once I'm back in England is to pour out tea and ask my lords how they take it. Do you take sugar? Do you take cream? Oh, what fools men are. To fall from the masthead because you see a woman's ankle. To parade all dressed up in the streets for a woman's praise, and yet to be the slave of the frailest chit in petticoats. To deny a woman teaching, lest she may laugh at you. What fools they make of us. And what fools we are. And yet... Orlando thought of the opportunities she would have as a woman enjoying the most exalted raptures known to the human spirit, which are contemplation, solitude, and love. Instantly, love took a human shape. And as all her loves had been women, and the human frame was slow to adapt itself to convention, though she was herself a woman, it was still a woman she loved. Oh, Sasha. 
those things which were so dark and mysterious to me as a man, now as a woman I understand. Those moods, those needs. Permit me, ma'am. The White Cliffs of England. Christ Jesus! Ma'am! Oh, forgive me, Captain. The sight of my native land after so long an absence. to see you looking so well. Uh, and Mr. Duffer, how good of you to be here to welcome me. We have, I fear, all grown older in your ladyship's long absence. Uh, but your ladyship looks remarkably well, considering the troubles you have been put to. Troubles, Mr. Duffer? Uh, I refer, of course, to the um, uh, lawsuits concerning your estate, your um, sex, and uh, your titles. Oh, those. The lawyers will fight over those, Mr. Duffer. Let us not concern ourselves about all that while there's still hot punch to be had in my house. Uh, <laughs> Do you make it as you used to, Mrs. Grimsley? Oh, I hope so, you know. You ladyship. I shall start with an orange stock full of clothes. And, and then, then let I'll us pay. go and drink some, for I tell you, I have no stomach for that insipid liquid called tea. <laughs> I shall pour it for others, but give me Mrs. Grimm's punch every time. <laughs> <laughs> Confound it. It's that absurd Archduchess, the one who chased me from England. Good afternoon, Your Grace. May I offer you a cup of tea? Oh, charmed, delighted. A plague on women. They never leave one a moment's peace. A more ferreting, inquisiting, busybodying set of people don't exist. Do you take sugar or... La, sir, beneath your cloak you are a man. Oh, gentle creature, forgive the deceit. It is, it is true that I am a man, as I have always been. But when I saw a portrait of you as a young man, I fell so hopelessly in love with you that I donned woman's apparel and came to lodge near your house. When you went to Turkey, I was nearly destroyed. But <laughs> as soon as I heard of your change, I hurried hither to offer you my hand, my heart, and all that is mine, which I, I should say, includes some twenty million ducats and more acres of good shooting than any other nobleman in England. And... and <laughs> if this is love, there's something highly ridiculous about it. It will land on the middle lump of sugar, my dear Orlando. I will bet 500 pounds on it. Oh. And I will bet 500 it lands on the one on the left. Dear God, there must be better things for a young woman in her prime to do than to spend all morning watching flies with an archduke. But how to get rid of him? That is the question. Orlando was still awkward in the arts of her sex, but she knew that to cheat at games was the most heinous of crimes. See, Your Grace, is it not buzzing round the ceiling? So, in order to avoid marrying the Archduke, who came every day to press his suit, she had resort to trickery. She mounted a dead blue bottle on a piece of sugar with some gum, and when her suitor was gazing at the ceiling, she substituted this lump for the one she had laid her money on. I have won again. See? It's See? Extraordinary luck you have, my dear Orlando. But let us have another game. This is better than horse racing. Very well. I bet on the one on the right. And I shall stay with the one in the middle. Has it flown over there by the window? No, I think not. But I... What are you doing with that piece of sugar? Doing, Archduke? You are cheating me. You are quite right, Archduke. Oh... 
Oh, you are welcome to the money. You are welcome to everything I have. But to cheat at games, that is unforgivable. I entirely agree with you. I would have nothing more to do with me if I were you. On the other hand, there are no witnesses. But, Archduke, how could either of us live with the knowledge? You are but a woman. I am prepared to forgive you on that score alone. Indeed, let me go on my knees to ask you... Oh! <laughs> what is this? It is a toad, my dear Archduke. I've been waiting all morning to drop it down your shirt. You have done this deliberately? I own. I have. <laughs> then forgive me. But this is too much. I bid you farewell. Forever. Heavens be praised. Within an hour of the Archduke's departure, Orlando was on her way to London. Which gives us this opportunity to make a few remarks about Orlando's sex. In every human being, a vacillation takes place from one sex to the other. Thus, though Orlando was bold and active as a man, she would burst into tears at the slightest provocation. Though she knew more than any farmer about crops, she was unversed in geography found mathematics intolerable, and held some caprices which are more common amongst women, as, for instance, that to travel south is to travel downhill. Often it is only the clothes which keep the male or female likeness, while underneath the sex is the very opposite of what it is above. Indeed, when she became bored with the society of London poets and wits, she would take from her cupboard the clothes she had worn as a young man of fashion and take a turn around the streets of the city. Good evening to you, Neville, sir. And a good evening to you, madam. Does your lordship fancy a little company on a night as fine as this? I would be delighted, ma'am. <laughs> I have a small room in Gerrard Street nearby where I could offer your lordship a little refreshment. Will you take my arm, ma'am? Oh, you are most gallant, sir. And you are very beautiful, if I may say so. <laughs> La, sir, what a compliment from an handsome gentleman. I assure you, I mean what I say. <laughs> My room is but a temporary lodging, sir. Decent rooms are so hard to come by, aren't they, sir? But uh, I think you'll find it comfortable. And um, do you inhabit the city, sir, or are you a country squire up on important business? This poor creature is making herself out to be a weak and foolish woman merely to gratify my masculinity. I look like a man, I talk like a man, I even feel like a man, and yet... If you will forgive me for a moment, sir, I'll, I'll go behind the screen to arrange myself a little better. You don't know what the night air does to a woman's skin and clothes. I shall be with you in a trice. Damn it. She's not thinking about me at all. This is all pretense because she thinks me a man. There, sir. I hope that is a little better. I am a woman, too. <laughs> oh, well, my dear, I'm by no means sorry to hear it. <laughs> but the plain principle of the matter is I'm not in the mood for the society of the other sex tonight. Indeed, I'm in the devil of a fix. Whereupon, making up the fire and stirring a bowl of punch, she told Orlando the whole story of her life. Since it is Orlando's story that engages us at present, we need not relate the adventures of Nell, the other lady, but certainly Orlando had never known the hours speed by more merrily. One night, as she looked out of her bedroom window after one of her wanderings, Orlando noticed a small cloud gathering behind the dome of St. Paul's. As the clock sounded, she saw it darken and spread with extraordinary speed. By the last strokes, a huge blackness sprawled over the whole of London. A turbulent welter of cloud covered the city. All was dark. All was doubt. All was confusion. The 18th century was over... The 19th century had begun. Oh. 
Why do I feel so cold? It must be this accursed damp. It was never so damp before. Do I imagine it? Or has it stolen in everywhere? It swells the wood, furs the kettle, rusts the iron, rots the stone. The floors feel damp, so we have to lay down rugs and carpets. The chairs feel damp, so we muffle them in cloth. Our clothes feel damp, so we wear more and more of them and tie them tight around our bodies. Wrap up ourselves and we wrap up our minds, too. But people don't talk direct as they used to. Just as the damp has made the ivy sprout and swaddle our houses, so we swaddle our conversation in fine phrases that mean nothing. And just as the damp earth has brought forth a riot of vegetation, so women, it seems to me, do nothing now but bring forth vast numbers of children. Oh! Oh! What is this tingling I feel? Orlando felt as if she were made of a thousand wires, upon which some breeze or errant fingers were playing scales. Now her toes tingled, now her arms sang and twanged, as the telegraph wires would be singing and twanging in twenty years or so. But all this agitation seemed at length to concentrate in her hands, then in one hand, and then in one finger of that hand. Then it contracted itself so that it made a ring of quivering sensibility about the third finger of her left hand. A wedding ring? One cannot escape the things. Great heavens! When the Archduke left me and I was launched upon London society, I was in search of life and a lover. To think that the spirit of this age would force me to submit to life and a husband... Weighed down by her crinoline, her feet soaked in her thin shoes, Orlando was, for the first time in her life, frightened. Frightened of ghosts and robbers. Perhaps it would be a comfort to have someone to lean on, to be able to sit down, to lie down, yes, and never, never to get up again. At every step in her garden, she glanced nervously round, lest some male form be hiding behind a bush. But then a wild notion overtook her of following the birds to the rim of the world and flinging herself on the spongy turf and there drinking forgetfulness. But the tough heather roots tripped her and flung her to the ground. Ah! Her ankle was broken. She could not rise, but there she lay content. Everyone is mated but me, and I have found my mate. It is the earth. Here I will lie. I shall dream wild dreams. Madam, you're hurt. Sir, I'm dead. A few minutes later, they became engaged. Perhaps, ma'am, I should tell you my name. It is Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmadine. I knew it. A name that goes with romance and chivalry, passion and melancholy, with rook's feathers twisting from the skies. <laughs> Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmadine. Ma, for when I'm dreamy, amorous, acquiescent, domestic and languid, uh. as if spiced logs were burning and it was a thought wet out of doors. Bonthrop, for when I'm solitary, when I want to meet death by myself, when I want to awe myself deep into solitude. Uh. And Shell, Shell, my name's Orlando. I knew it. How did you know? If you see a ship in full sail coming with the sun on it, proudly sweeping across the Mediterranean from the South Seas... Why one says at once, Orlando? Dearest Shell, to find someone at last who knows within seconds all the important things about me. I'm passionately in love with you, Shell. And I with you, Orlando. But, but... An awful suspicion rushed into both their minds simultaneously. You're a woman, Shell. You're a man, Orlando. No, Shell, no, I swear to you, I can prove I you. can demonstrate beyond any possible doubt. My darling Shell. Oh... Oh, I am a woman, a real woman at last. 
Thank you, Shell. Thank you. And they talked for hours and days, though it is scarcely worth reporting what they said, for they knew each other so well they could say anything they liked, which is tantamount to saying nothing. In that time, Orlando's lawsuits were settled. Her sex was confirmed as female. Her estate was to descend to heirs male of her body, or in default of marriage. The wind! I must join my ship and sail round the horn. Oh. Quick, Orlando, let us get married. Oh. Where's the prayer book? Uh, here, Mr. Duper, here. Ah, thank you, Stubbs. Uh, help me with this tie. And light more candles, sir. Silence! Lady Orlando and Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine, kneel down. The ring! The ring! I now pronounce you. <laughs> Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine! Husband! Orlando, my wife! And then I came to a field where the springing grass was dull by the hanging cups of fritillaries, sullen and foreign-looking the snaky flower, scarfed in dull purple like Egyptian girls. But does it make sense? Stop! And let us see. Who are you? I am the spirit of the age. Oh, sir. Read what I've written, I beg you, and tell me if it's all right. Hmm. Grass will pass. And the hanging cups of fritillaries. Yes. I like that. Admirable. Oh, sir, I'm so grateful. The snaky flower now. A thought strong from the pen of a lady, perhaps. Do you really think so? Well, well, uh, Wordsworth would probably sanction it, so we'll let that go. But uh, girls, Egyptian girls, are they necessary? Well, you see, sir, my husband... Oh, you have a husband now. Indeed, sir. See, here is the wedding ring on the third finger of the left hand. And it's magic work, sir. Now that I'm a married woman, I no longer suffer from the tinglings that recently affected me. And your husband? He is sailing round Cape Horn. You say now. Doesn't that count? I like him, sir. But that's all right in marriage, isn't it? And I like other people. But that's all right too, isn't it? But most of all, I want to write poetry. Is that all right, sir, in marriage? Well... If your husband is sailing round the horn... He does it all the time, sir. Well, that's all right, then. We like to encourage that sort of thing. Carry on, my dear, carry on. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Orlando made a deep bow to the spirit of the age. Much as the traveller, conscious that he has a bundle of cigars in the corner of his suitcase, bows to the customs officer who has just been good enough to scribble with white chalk on the lid. She heaved a deep sigh of relief. And, well, she might, for the transaction between a writer and the spirit of the age is one of infinite delicacy. And upon a nice arrangement between the two, the whole fortune of his work depends. Orlando had so ordered it that she need neither fight her age nor submit to it. She was it, yet remained herself. Now she could write. And she did. And wrote and wrote and wrote. And when she at last put down her pen and said, Done. She wanted someone to read what she had oh. written. At once. Immediately. Stubbs. Dash it, Stubbs. For the first time in her life, Orlando turned against nature. Dogs and flowers were everywhere, but they cannot read. It was an oversight on the part of Providence, which had never struck her before. Only humans can read. She needed humans instantly. You rang, my lady. Order my carriage, Stubbs. I must go at once to London. Well, if your ladyship permits, 
There's still time to catch the 11.45. The what, Stubbs? The railway train, my lady. One leaves at 11.45 and will get you to London in under an hour. Gracious heavens! Then get me on it, Stubbs. Do whatever's necessary. elderly gentleman from somewhere. I recognise the walk. When did I meet him and where? Could it be? No. But he looks so neat, so portly, so prosperous. Cane in hand, flower in buttonhole, neat white moustache instead of an untidy beard. It can't be. It is. Nick Green. Oh, oh, oh. The lady or Lambeau. <laughs> Mr. Green. <clears throat> or is it Sir Nicholas? I have indeed that honour, dear lady. I guessed as much. May I inquire, of course I should know, but which of your many talents has the Queen singled out? I think, uh, of course one cannot be sure, but I think it was for my um, critical work. Critical? Of what? Why, of others, writing, dear lady. I've just published my 20th volume, as a matter of fact. Its subject is Pope. Ah, the last of those one may truly call poets. <laughs> when one compares him with those now writing... Such as whom, Sir Nicholas? Oh, Tennyson, Browning, you know the sort of thing. All in the pay of booksellers, you see. Ready to turn out anything that'll pay their tailor's bills. <laughs> as, as I was saying in my lectures, but the other day... Lectures? Oh, I frequently discourse about my old friends. Pope, Addison, Steele, Laglor. Damn, damn, damn. Here I have believed literature to be wild as the wind, hot as fire, swift as lightning all these years. And all it consists of is an elderly gentleman in a grey suit dropping names. <gasps> oh, I'm so sorry. What is it, dear lady? It's just a manuscript. A manuscript? How excessively interesting. Permit me to peruse it. Oh, but this is as good as Addison's Cato. There is no trace, I am thankful to say, of the modern spirit. It is composed, my dear lady, with regard to truth, to nature, to the dictates of the human heart, which is rare indeed in these days of unscrupulous eccentricity. This must, of course, be published. Oh, Sir Nicholas. I shall see to it immediately. Immediately. With Sir Nicholas's promise of getting her published ringing in her ears, Orlando went home to her house in Mayfair and stood looking out of her window, wondering what would happen to her next. And how can we veil, cover or conceal what this event will be? How can the biographer tell this delicately? <laughs> Thank heavens for the barrel organ. Let its music fill the time until the moment comes which it is impossible to deny is coming, which the footman has seen, and the servants, and the listener too will have to see. Hail, happiness, and hail. It is a very fine boy, my lady. The world seems to have shrunk. And the sky. It's bright all night long now. No privacy, no shadows, everything light. Even the pavements. Look how narrow the women have become. Like cornstalks. Straight, shining, identical. And as she was thinking this, the immensely long tunnel in which she seemed to have been travelling for hundreds of years widened. And the light poured in. It was ten o'clock in the morning. It was the 11th of October. 
It was 1928. It was the moment of writing this biography. Can I help you, madam? I need boys' boots, bath salts, sardines. What more terrifying revelation can there be than that we are in the present? That we survive the shock at all is only possible because the past shelters us on one side, the future on the other. But we have no time now for reflection. Orlando was in Marshall and Snellgroves. She read out the list of her wants as if she were holding the words under a tap of many-coloured water. She watched them change as the light fell on them. Bath and boots became blunt, obtuse. Sardines serrated itself like a saw. She looked this way and that, and then got into the lift, for the good reason that the door stood open. It's magic. I rise through the air, I see men flying, and I can't begin to wonder how it's done. First floor, sheets and linen. Sheets, yes, for a double bed. There, madam. As she was fingering the linen, one of the swing doors opened and let in a whiff of scent, waxen and tinted as from pink candles. And the scent curved like a shell around a figure. Was it a boy's or was it a girl's? Furred, pearled in Russian trousers. Faithless! And all the shops seemed to pitch and toss with yellow water, and far off she saw the masts of the Russian ship standing out to sea. Sasha! Any napkins, towels, dusters today, madam? She's so fat, so lethargic. She mustn't see me. Faithless. Mistress of a grand duke, perhaps. Fat, grey and furred. Oh, Sasha. My Sasha. No. What I need is bath salts. I'm afraid Madam will have to obtain those from the floor below. Then that will be all. Thank you. This is the onset of middle age. Time has passed over me. Someone lights a pink candle and I see a girl in pink trousers. The traffic begins to move and I see the Thames unfreezing. In the sky I see the mountains of Turkey. That Orlando had gone a little too far from the present moment will perhaps strike the listener who sees her getting into her motor car full of visions of Turkish mountains. Yet those who most successfully practice the art of life, often quite unknown people, by the way, somehow manage to synchronise the 60 or 70 different times which beat simultaneously in every human system. For them... The present is neither a violent disruption nor completely forgotten in the past. My oak tree on which I can be. Oh, a million candled Christmas tree. Abnormal. Abnormal. Such legs, Charlie. A shame to let a pair of glories like that out of the kingdom. A toad? Oh, oh, I have never been so insulted in my life. Sailing round the hall. What else can a man do these days? It gives me great pleasure to present to the Lady Orlando the Burdett Coop's memorial prize for her fine poem, The Oak Tree. A poem, I may say that I have been privileged to open Fame! <laughs> Seven editions. A poet, am I? And a charlatan. Fame. <laughs> I 
quite like to say that it is very upsetting for the biographer to have the culmination of this work dashed from us by a laugh such as Orlando's. But the truth is, when we write of a woman, everything is out of place. The accent never falls where it does with a man. There flies the wild goose. I have stretched after it, but it flies too fast. I have seen it here, I've seen it in Persia and in Italy. Always it flies out to sea, and always I fling after it words like nets. But they shrivel, like the nets I've seen shrivel when they're drawn on deck with only seaweed in them. But sometimes there's an inch of silver, six words in the bottom. But never, never the great fish who lives in the coral groves. Orlando walked in her park with her dogs. Everything was partly something else, but each gained an odd moving power from this union of itself and something not itself. Her mind became a forest in which things moved. At last she came to the oak tree. It had grown bigger, sturdier, and more knotted since she had known it, somewhere around the year 1588, but it was still in the prime of life. I am riding the back of the world. Now, where's my copy of the poem? I should have brought a trowel to bury it here. A tribute. A return to the land of what the land has given me. Oh, but how silly that sounds. Poetry is a secret transaction. A voice answering a voice. The cold breeze of the present brushed her face with its little breath of fear. Here, Shell! Here! My darling Orlando! My dearest Shell! <sighs> The goose, the wild goose. In Orlando, which was dramatized from Virginia Woolf's novel by Peter Buckman, the part of Orlando was played by Jenny Stoller and the narrator by Vivian Pickles. Green was Peter Woodthorpe, Sasha Amanda Murray, the Archduke Richard O'Callaghan and Shelmerdine David McAllister. Stubbs was Lockwood West, Mrs. Grimsditch Jane Wenham, Dupper John Bott, Queen Elizabeth Margot Boyd, King Charles William Edel, Nell Gwynne, Helena Breck, and Lady Margaret, Heather Tobias. The sea captain was played by Arnold Diamond, the first secretary by Danny Schiller, and the shop assistant by Hilda Schroeder. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The music was composed by James Walker and played by James and Simon Walker. The director was Penny Gold.